Welcome to this, the, very, the last panel of this year ESCB conference. By now I have the feeling the other panelists have set the bar very high, but I, I think we are not going to disappoint you in, in this panel. I'm Carmen Hernandez. I am a head of section at the legal department of the ECB, and I'm delighted to introduce you to the topic of this panel, which is the National Competent Authority's duty of assistance and the ECB's duty of diligence when, in performing its supervisory tasks, has to assess anti-money laundering, to which I will refer as AML, and counter-terrorism financing, to which I will refer as CTF. So under the SSM regulation, the ECB is exclusively competent to perform a specific task in prudential supervision. At the same time, AML and CTF related supervisory tasks have not been conferred to the ECB and remain with competent authorities at national level. Notwithstanding this, significant points of contact exist between AML and CTF supervision and the ECB's supervisory tasks. For example, AML CTF related findings can be relevant to assess the suitability of a board member in fit and proper proceedings or a proposed acquirer of a qualifying holding in a bank. The ECB is also exclusively competent to withdraw the authorization of credit institutions for serious breaches of AML CFT rules. Competent authorities including the ECB, of course, so they charge the responsibilities in full respect of the distribution of tasks decided by the legislator. And at the same time, appropriate integration of AML CFT issues into prudential supervision should be ensured. The effectiveness of the system relies in two principles, the NCA's duty to assist the ECB and the duty of diligence which bounds the ECB when exercising its task. Applying this in practice may involve certain difficulties on the legal side. <clears throat> this has come to light in several occasions during the last years. Some disputes have reached the Court of Justice of the European Union also. The Versa Bank and the ABB cases concern actions for annulment against ECB decisions to withdraw the authorization of credit institutions for, among other things, breaches of AML provisions. In these cases, the General Court has made important considerations that help to clarify the delineation of competences between the ECB and the national competent authorities. Today, in this panel, we will have the opportunity to discuss about these issues with three knowledgeable and experienced lawyers that will offer diverse perspectives on the matter. I have had the pleasure to work with them in numerous occasions, and I hold each of them in high esteem, not only professionally, but also personally. I am thrilled to share this virtual table with all of them today. Let me introduce each of them in order of their appearance before we start the discussion. So in the first place, we have Odrone Estabilite, who joined us from Brussels. She has been a member of the legal service of the European Commission since 2002. And since 2013, she was directly involved in the creation and development of the banking union and her field of expertise covered bank supervision, bank resolution, capital requirements, European supervisory authorities, as well as sustainable finance. Odrone has represented the European Commission in more than 350 court cases before the Court of Justice of the European Union, and she has published in the field of union law with a specific emphasis on banking law, free movement of capital, as well as union cohesion policy and structural instruments. Today, Odrone will walk us through the general framework on the distribution of competencies between the ECB and the national competent authorities, 
paying special attention to the views of the Court of Justice on this field. Odrone will also touch upon the recent legislative developments in the field of AML CFT. Then we will listen to Georgia Marafiotti, who is here in Frankfurt besides me. She is senior legal counsel in the supervisory law division of the ECB's legal department. And since 2017, she has been providing legal advice to the ECB's banking supervision arm and representing the ECB before the Court of Justice of the European Union in several cases related to banking supervision. Prior to joining the ECB, Georgia worked for the Banking Supervision Department of Banca d'Italia and previously for a prestigious international law firm focusing on corporate and banking law issues and international arbitration. Today, Georgia will provide interesting reflections on the role of the ECB when it comes to integrate AML CFT issues into prudential supervision. Last but not least, we will listen to Rafael Martinez Lozano, who joined us today from Madrid. He is a senior lawyer in the Regulatory and Supervisory Advice Division at Banco de España Legal Department. He advises on legal issues relating to supervision and resolution of credit institutions, including the drafting of related legislation. He also worked for the Supervisory Law Division of the ECB's Directorate General Legal Service between 2017 and 2019, providing legal advice on topics related to the SSM framework. Prior to joining Banco de España's legal department, Rafael worked for a leading law firm in Spain, where his practice was focused on public law and regulated sectors. Rafael will present to us the particular point of view of an NCA that it's not the national AML CFT authority, which adds another level of complexity to the system I just described. Odrone, Georgia, Rafa, thank you very much for having accepted the ECB invitation, for being here today and participate in this discussion. Before we start, I would like just to remind the audience about a few housekeeping rules. The panelists will deliver their presentations on a row and then we will open the floor for questions and discussion. You are invited to submit your questions by raising the hand button that you can find in WebEx. At that moment, you will be invited to ask your question and it's then when you will be able or you should unmute yourself and switch on your camera and then ask your question. And with this, I am delighted to give the floor, without further ado, to Odron. Thank you, Carmen. Good afternoon. Uh, in my presentation, I will essentially speak about the three following aspects. First, I will briefly cover uh, exclusive ECB powers in a decentralized cooperation framework. Second, relying on the recent case law, I will speak about the NCA's supportive function in dealing with AML CFT breaches in authorization withdrawal process. Thirdly, I will uh, briefly present main AML CFT legislative developments in CRD. And finally, I will draw some conclusions. First slide, please. The SSM regulation provides that when the ECB exercises its exclusive competences as prudential supervisor, ensuring compliance or with the relevant union law, the ECB is assisted by the national competent authorities. The General Court confirmed in its Verso Bank judgment that the powers which were not conferred on the ECB remain vested in the NCAs. So the SSM centralizes functions related to prudential supervision with the ECB and provides at the same time for decentralized implementation by the NCAs, yet always under the supervision of the ECB, to which the NCAs provide their cooperation and assistance. While the ECB exercises direct prudential supervision of significant credit institutions, the prudential supervision of less significant institutions is part of the already mentioned decentralized exercise of powers by the NCAs. So in a nutshell, 
contextually, rather than giving uh, having a distribution of powers between the ECB and the NCs in the performance of tasks referred to in Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the SSM regulation, the SSM regulation establishes that exclusive powers delegated to the ECB are implemented in a centralized framework. Second slide, please. More specifically, in the area of the AML safety, from the creation of the single supervisory mechanism, one could observe a possible tension of competences that belong to the national authorities on one hand and the ECB on the other hand. That aspect has already been by now addressed in the case law, to which I will soon refer. But first of all, on one hand, recitals 28 and 29 of the system regulation list among the supervisory tasks not conferred on the ECB and which should remain with the national authorities, the prevention of the use of the financial system for the purpose of money laundering and terrorist financing. On the other hand, it follows from the combined reading of Articles 4, Paragraph 1 and 6 of the SSM regulation that the power to withdraw authorizations from credit institutions is reserved exclusively to the ECB. So the assisting role of the national competent authorities is particularly important in the withdrawal of authorizations due to the AML CFT concerns. As can be seen from Article 67 of CRD, the withdrawal of an authorization is also provided for where a credit institution fails to comply with the AML CFT requirements. Therefore, compliance with AML CFT requirements and obligations uh, is somewhat part of the prudential supervision since the use of the financial system for money laundering purposes is likely to threaten the stability, integrity, and reputation of the financial system and therefore of the single market. But may the ECB adopt a decision withdrawing a banking authorization because of the infringement of AML CFT provisions alone? Would the ECB have sufficient competence for that? And the answer is absolutely yes. Article 18.F of the CRD provides that banking authorizations may be withdrawn if the credit institution commits at least one of the breaches uh, foreseen in Article 67, Paragraph 1 of the CRD. For example, when the authority identifies a serious breach of the national provisions adopted pursuant to the AML CFT directive. In exercising its competence related to the withdrawal of authorization, the ECB is therefore obliged to apply inter alia the national law provisions transposing the CRD. In the Versobank judgment, the General Court rejected arguments that owing to the division of powers between the NCAs and the ECB, Together with the principle of proportionality, the full range of other milder measures, for instance, fines or prohibition to carry out certain activities, must be first exhausted before an authorization can be withdrawn uh, on grounds of AML CFT infringement. In another uh, famous, very recent judgment, the AAB judgment, rendered in June this year, the General Court uh, made another important uh, declaration. Uh, it was recognized as sufficient if national authority adopts an administrative decision establishing a serious breach of AML CFT law, and there is no requirement that a judgment or a decision having uh, res judicata effects recognizes credit institutions' responsibility for the AML CFT breach. The AAB judgment also clarified that from the moment the national administrative decision becomes final, meaning it is not possible to challenge that decision in the national court any longer, the question of prescription related to the facts established in that decision cannot be raised anymore. And hence the ECB is fully legally entitled to rely on the factual aspects set out in such a final administrative decision. 
In other words, the fact that the AML safety breaches are old or have been corrected it has no bearing on the incurrence of the credit institution liability. Moreover, the seriousness of those breaches established in the final national uh, administrative decision may no longer be challenged in the administrative procedure applied by the ECB. One of the most important policy related aspects established in the AEB judg judgment is linked to the general objective of safeguarding the European banking system. The general court takes a firm stance concerning corrected, corrected AM, uh, AML CFT breaches and states that if such corrected breaches could no longer justify a withdrawal of authorization, credit institutions that have committed serious breaches would be permitted to continue their activities as long as the competent authorities do not demonstrate again that they have committed new breaches and that would not be acceptable. The division of powers between the NCAs and the ECB under the SSM in practice requires that the facts constituting breaches of the AML CFT legislation are established by the national authorities, often specialized in their area. Whereas the legal assessment of whether those facts justified withdrawal of authorization and the assessment of proportionality uh, are reserved for the ECB. The ECB therefore has to rely on its own assessment of compliance with the national provisions in that regard. It should be noted that having a union institution such as the ECB to rely on the findings made by another institution situated at a different level or even in a different legal order is not a novel situation. This is why when the ECB considers to undertake its own assessment of the facts and the legal grounds of the case in order to exercise its discretion, this assessment is to be distinguished from the, the investigation or determination of relevant facts. The ECB is not obliged in the case of less significant credit institutions to carry out its own investigation, but may validly rely on factual findings provided to it by the national competent authorities. Since the adoption of the SSM regulation and CRD4 in 2013, the General Court provided important insights on the underlying principles of cooperation between NCAs and the ECB when assessing AML CFT aspects relevant for the ECB supervisory task. Further developments in jurisprudence are, of course, expected at the very least because the judgment in the Verso Bank has been already appealed and the same could also happen for the AP judgment. Uh, next slide, please. I will now speak about uh, the legislative developments that affect uh, cooperation between the ECB and NCAs in the area of AML uh, CFT. Since 2013, the Commission, via its legislative proposals, uh, amending CRD4 uh, that the Union co-legislators adopted established new rules in the area of AML CFT that further strengthened the assistance of national authorities for the supervisory work of the ECB. The so-called CRD5 amendment adopted in June 2019 strengthened the obligations of cooperation between competent authorities, financial intelligence units, and authorities entrusted with the public duty of supervising credit institutions under the AML directive. All those authorities within their respective competences must now provide each other with information relevant for their respective tasks on the CRD, CRR, and AMLD. In particular, where the evaluation of the government's, uh, government's arrangements, the business model or the activities of the institution give the banking supervisor reasonable grounds to suspect that money laundering or terrorist financing is being or has been committed or there is an increased risk thereof, the supervisor is subject to a legal obligation to immediately notify the ML authority. 
the banking supervisor and the AML authority will then produce their common assessment to be immediately sent to the EBA. The next amendment, the CRD 6 proposal adopted by the Commission in October last year and currently still examined by co-legislators, attempts introducing further AML CFT means that are considered essential for maintaining stability and integrity of the financial system, system in the Union. The banking supervisors under the proposal would be required to consistently factor in money laundering and terrorist financing concerns into the relevant supervisory activities. The CFD6 proposal specifically focuses on the acquisition and divestiture of uh, qualifying holdings, material transfers of assets and liabilities, mergers and divisions, as well as authorization of third country branches. All those operations are considered to be material for the functioning of credit institutions. And therefore, competent authorities would be required to assess whether money laundering or terrorist financing is being or has been committed or attempted, or there is a risk uh, of such an activity before the proposed operation could be approved. A final compromise between the European Parliament and the Council on the CRD6 proposal is not, however, expected until the end of this year and uh, to be seen how uh, at the end the provisions adopted be uh, specifically formulated. So now I, will, would, I would like to uh, draw some conclusions um, on uh, the debated subject. It is to be considered that exclusive supervisory powers conferred to the ECB by the SSM regulation specifically did not include responsibilities in the area of AML CFT, as those responsibilities were left uh, with the relevant national authorities. The Verso Bank and the AAB judgment provided dividing lines between the assistance of NCAs and the decisional discretion of the ECB when establishing and assessing AML CFT breaches in the authorization withdrawal process. Those judgments also confirm the autonomous value of the AML CFT related breaches in justifying the withdrawal of authorization. An explicit legal basis for integrating AML CFT risks into prudential supervision came into effect in June 2019 with the CRD5 uh, amendment and provided the ECB with the ground for looking into the AML CFT risk when carrying out prudential supervision. Given the importance of the AML CFT policy in the Union, the Commission's proposal for CRD6 clearly aims at further strengthening the synergies between the AML, uh, CFT monitoring and prudential supervision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Odrone, for this clear and comprehensive presentation of the delineation of powers within the SSM and also for providing interesting insight in the recent developments in the regulatory framework. I am happy to give now the floor to Georgia, who will present very interesting reflections on the ACB duties that the ACB has to comply with when taking supervisory decisions that have to integrate also AML CFT aspects. Georgia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carmen, and good afternoon, everybody. So, in her presentation, Odron explained that even though the ECB is not competent to supervise compliance with AML CFT legislation, it integrates AML CFT concerns systematically when performing its prudential tasks. In light of the close connection between AML CFT supervision and prudential supervision, it is essential that the ECB duly accounts for AML CFT aspects in the exercise of its supervisory tasks. It is yet equally essential that in doing so, the ECB remains within the remit of its competence and does not exceed the boundaries of the powers conferred on it by the SSM regulation. So the delicate balance of these two aspects 
brings into play, as you can see in the slide, two relevant principles of union law. On one side, we have the principle of care as defined by union courts, which sometimes refer to this concept also as duty of diligence. So these principles, uh, this principle requires EU institutions to perform a full and impartial assessment of all relevant facts before exercising their powers. On the other hand, we have the principle of conferral, providing that the European Union can act only within the limits of the competencies conferred upon it. So this will be the focus of my presentation today, which will review how the ECB, when examining AML CFD aspects, complies with the principle of good administration, and in particular with the duty of care, without overstepping its powers. Next slide, please. So the starting point of our discussion is the notion of duty of care, which became widely acknowledged following the landmark judgment delivered in 1991 by the Court of Justice in the Technische Universität München case. The formulation developed in this judgment, which was often reiterated in subsequent case law, identifies the duty of care as the duty of the competent institution to examine carefully and impartially all the relevant aspects of the individual case when adopting its decisions. So union courts consider the duty of care to be inherent in the principle of good administration and have consistently ruled that this duty applies also when an institution exercises discretionary administrative powers. In fact, in the court's view, compliance with the duty of care is all the more Excuse me, excuse me for this interruption. I think we have some technical issues with the camera, and unfortunately, the audience cannot see you. Georgia. Okay. And they are seeing you, we... which I'm, okay. not, I'm not now the most interesting person to do that. <laughs> so, apologies for this. I think we are going to exchange places so you can really see Georgia and listen better to the interesting presentations. In the meantime. So, I was saying that. In the court's view, compliance with the duty of care is all the more important in procedures for the adoption of decisions entailing a broad discretion, as in these cases, the institution's power of appraisal is, so to say, circumscribed by the principle of care. Many eminent scholars have investigated the central role played by the duty of care in calibrating the intensity of judicial review of discretionary acts underlining how this duty has become a tool for union courts to revise the factual basis of administrative decisions. One of these scholars, Professor Hoffman, in his research on the role and scope of the due care requirement, distinguishes two dimensions of the duty of care. The first dimension is the so-called factual element, connected to the fact collection activity underlining administrative decisions whereby, in principle, all relevant facts substantiating a decision shall be collected by the decision-making authority. Compliance with this dimension of the duty of care requires that evidence collected for the purposes of the decision contains all the information which must be taken into account in order to assess a complex situation, so the most complete information possible, but also that such evidence is factually accurate and consistent, so the most reliable information possible. The second dimension of the due care requirement is the so-called cognitive element, which entails a diligent and impartial assessment of the evidence collected. So compliance with this second dimension of the duty of care requires that the final act can logically be based on and is consistent with the factual and legal elements on which it relies. For the system entailing a broad discretion, compliance with this second element of the duty of care is all the more important, according to the court, because the exercise of that discretion is only subject to a limited judicial review of the merits, confined to examining whether a manifest error has been committed. So the duty of care is therefore a general obligation which union institutions shall comply with throughout the process leading to the exercise of their administrative powers and the adoption of their decisions. It should be noted, though, 
that the scope of such obligation cannot be defined in, term, in general terms and shall rather be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. The duty of care is therefore to use the words of Advocate General Spooner in the recent case SGL Carbon versus Commission, an obligation of variable contours, since its scope is shaped by the provisions determining the powers and the discretion of an administration in a particular case. This is a relevant point for our discussion because it suggests that the scope of the ECB's duty of care not only cannot be at odds with the boundaries to the ECB's competencies, but is even shaped by them. So in the present case, this entails that since supervision of compliance with AML CFT legislation is not a task which has been conferred on the ECB by the SSM regulation, the ECB cannot carry out AML CFT related supervisory tasks or enforce AML CFT legislation. If this were done, the ECB would encroach on the competence of national authorities and would thus breach union law. In concrete terms, this means that whenever AML CFT aspects come into relevance for the adoption of its decisions, the ECB needs to rely on facts established by the relevant AML authority. This leads us to examine how the principle of conferral contributes to delineate the scope of the ECB's duty of care when assessing AML CFT aspects. An attempt to better define this scope can be made building upon the two previously recalled dimensions of the due care requirement. Next slide, please. So in the fact collection phase, since the ECB lacks, as we have seen, the competence to investigate or establish itself the facts submitted by the AML authority, the reliability of such facts may only be assessed by verifying whether they appear to be well-founded, sufficiently specific, accurate, and consistent. For this purpose, the ECB should take into account all relevant aspects of the concrete case, including how and where the determinations of the AML authority have been made, and should request, if needed, relevant clarification and additional evidence to the AML authority. An analogy could be drawn with the scope of the duty of care of the Council when adopting restrictive measures upon information provided by the Sanctions Committee of the United Nations or by authorities of a third country. According to the case law in this field, the Council, in order to discharge its duty of care, is required to assess on the basis of the circumstances of the case, whether it is necessary to seek the disclosure of additional evidence from the sanctions committee or the third country authority, if it transpires that the evidence already supplied is not sufficient. Different considerations come into relevance when we look at the scope of the ECB's duty of care when performing the assessment of the factual and legal elements of the case in order to conclude whether the adoption of a certain decision would be warranted. So in this phase, the assessment phase, the scope of the ECB's duty of care is not constrained by the boundaries to the ECB's powers, because this assessment only rests on prudential considerations, which entirely fall in the ECB's competence. The ECB, in fact, enjoys full discretion in assessing which conclusions, if any, are to be drawn from AML CFT findings for the purposes of potential prudential supervisory action. A concrete example of how the two dimensions of the due care requirement interact when the ECB examines AML CFT aspects in the exercise of its supervisory tasks can be found in license withdrawal procedures based on serious breaches of AML CFT provisions. Next slide, please. So in this respect, it should be recalled that in the SSM legal framework, the ECB has the exclusive competence to withdraw authorizations of all creative institutions, irrespective of their size. From a procedural perspective, the withdrawal of a license qualifies as a composite procedure, where the NCA submits a preparatory act and the ECB exercises alone the final decision-making power. Taking, of course, into full account 
the justification put forward by the NCA, but without being bound by its proposal. So the legal framework, while allowing the ECB to exercise full discretion on the decision to withdraw a license, expressly requires it to take into account some elements when doing so. These elements are laid down in Article 83 SSM Framework Regulation, which sets the standard of the ECB's duty of care in the context of withdrawal procedures and plays an even more important role in the context of license withdrawals concerning less significant institutions falling under the direct supervision of relevant NCAs. This is compliance with the duty of care in the context of withdrawal procedures based on serious AML CFD breaches has been subject to judicial review into recent judgments of the General Court, which provide interesting clarifications on this topic. Next slide, please. The first judgment concerns an action for an amendment against the ECB decision withdrawing the license of Bersobank. The contested decision was based also on the ground for withdrawal under Article 18F in conjunction with 6710 CRD, having regard to the FSA's findings, so the NCA's findings of repeated and serious AML CFD breaches committed by the bank. In the part of the judgment dealing with the ECB's compliance with the duty to conduct a careful and impartial assessment of the relevant aspects of the case, the General Court builds an argument which brings together the principle of care and the principle of conferral. The premise on which the court's reasoning rests is that in light of the allocation of powers and the cooperation duty between the ECB and the, SS and the FSA, so the NCA, within the SSM, the ECB was indeed entitled to rely in order to substantiate its decision on the information included in the NCA's proposal. Based on this premise, the court further developed its argument with reference to specific facts included in this proposal, namely the FSA's findings of breaches which have not been properly challenged by the bank, I'm quoting the judgment here, and considers that these findings had to be treated by the ECB as established facts and as not requiring, for that reason, a review by the ECB. The conclusion, this conclusion reached by the court, takes account of the fact that, as we already said, when it comes to AML CFT breaches, the ECB needs to rely on the findings of the AML authority. This, however, cannot offset the ECB's obligation to comply with the principle of care. A relevant indication in this direction can be found in the prominence given by the court to the fact that in the present case, the breaches had not been properly challenged by the bank. So this is an element which corroborates the reliability of the FSA's findings. It is therefore only after having assessed that these findings constituted a complete and reliable set of information that the ECB had to consider them as established facts, and again quoting the court, rightly confined itself to verifying whether they indeed constituted grounds justifying the withdrawal of authorization. Next slide, please. The second judgment providing relevant clarifications on the scope of the ECB's duty of care in the context of withdrawal procedures concerns the action for annulment against the ECB decision withdrawing the license of Anglo-Austrian Bank, so AAB Bank. In this judgment, the court reviews the ECB's compliance with the duty of care, drawing a distinction between the two grounds for withdrawal on which the contested decision was based. As concerns on the one side, the ground relating to serious AML CFT infringements, the court notes that the ECB complied with the duty of care because it demonstrated the existence of relevant facts justifying the withdrawal of authorization by relying on available evidence, such as, for example, decisions of the national authorities, so the FMA in this case, and rulings of national courts. Therefore, the ECB did not simply refer to the breaches laid down in the FMA's proposal, but it ascertained a constaté in the judgment for the purposes of the examination of facts and evidence available 
that the bank had been found liable of serious AML CFD breaches. As concerns the ground for withdrawal relating, on the other hand, the failure to have in place appropriate and robust governance arrangements, which is a matter that, contrary to AML CFD aspects, falls squarely within the ECB's competence, the Court notes that the ECB complied with the duty of care because it verified itself the breaches of prudential provisions asserted by the FMA, meaning that the ECB based its decision on its own assessment of compliance with national provisions transposing Article 74 CRB in the Austrian legal framework. So the findings of the court in the AAB Bank case, therefore, confirm that compliance with the duty of care is to be assessed against the scope of the ECB's competence. Next slide, please. While the Verso Bank and AEB Bank judgments offer a valuable contribution in clarifying how the ECB should integrate AML CFD concerns in withdrawal procedure, they still leave open the point concerning the scope of the ECB's duty of care in the exercise of other supervisory tasks, such as, for instance, the assessment of qualifying holding acquisitions. Interesting questions which arise in this respect concern, for instance, the scope of the ECB's assessment of criterion under Article 23 1 ECRD, so the criterion related to suspicion of money laundering or terrorist financing or the increased risk thereof. And of course, the standard of reliability for evidence substantiating such criterion. Further reflection, uh, in my view, would be warranted on these aspects, which deserve particular attention also in light of practical implications they may have on the interaction between the ECB and national authorities in the context of qualifying holding procedures. In conclusion, although the findings of the court in the Verso Bank and AEB Bank cases do not provide a direct answer to all open questions, it seems to me that these judgments, read together with the case law on the duty of care, clearly show the direction which the ECB should follow to address them. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Georgia, for this interesting presentation and also to bring into our attention interesting open questions that, on which I fully agree with you, further reflection is needed. I am looking forward to listen to Rafael now, who will bring the interesting perspective of an NCA. And as we will hear in a minute from Rafael, an NCA that also has its own specificities that make it very, even more interesting. Thank you, Rafa, the floor is yours. Okay, many thanks, Carmen, Odron, Georgia. Hello, everyone. Please, let's move to the slide with the agenda, please. The second one. Well, the purpose of my presentation is to fairly describe a bit the particularities of the Spanish framework on the supervision of anti-money laundering and also presenting you some legal challenges that Banco de España faces as prudential supervisor. Then I will raise some open questions and reflections on the potential impact that recent court cases like Verso Bank may have on the prudential supervisory practice followed so far. Finally, I will close with a short recap, but I would like also to give you a flavor of the new legislative developments on the anti-money laundering area complementing the initiatives presented by Odron in the CRD. Please bear in mind that uh, for being more fluent while speaking, I will also refer to MLA instead of the long version of anti-money laundering and corporate terrorist finance. Next slide, please. So as a short introduction to my presentation, uh, I will talk about the relevance of MLA risk in the prudential supervision of banks, which Odron has already announced. Cases of breaches of AML legislation have shown that indeed they have a significant impact on banks. Money laundering can damage banks' reputations, governance arrangements, the funding, and also affects the customer relationships. But not only that, on a larger scale, those breaches are a threat to the viability of banks. Therefore, and as a conclusion, the way banks design their AML functions are relevant to prudential supervisors along the life cycle of banks. This is when granting a bike license, when assessing where the bank managers are fit and proper for the job, 
in the assessment of, acquis of acquisition of qualifying holdings, but also on an ongoing basis, for example, in the SREP. Finally, the competent authority should also take them into consideration to assess whether and when a bank license should be withdrawn due to AML breaches. The impact of AMLA risk in the prudential supervision has been already acknowledged by European legislators who have been taking steps to strengthen the link between AML and prudential supervision. As Adron has explained, there are more amendments to come in the CRD6 to further reflect the interaction between both areas. Next slide, please. So the European legislator has decided so far that the competition on AML should remain under the national authorities. This is, of course, without the prejudice of the leading role of the European Banking Authority that is looking for a more consistent AML supervision and the future European Authority on AML that I will mention later. As there are evident links between AML and prudential supervision, in the vast majority of SSM jurisdictions, national legislators has opted for allocating the supervision of AML risk also to the prudential supervisor. However, in other jurisdictions like Spain or Malta, and at, at, at the SSM level, the ECB, the AML authority is not the same as the prudential supervisor. As a consequence, as a consequence in, in these scenarios, it is essential that both supervisors exchange information and work very closely. In any case, the delineation of risk and competence between AML and prudential framework is not so easy. On the table shown on the slide, I describe the main differences between both frameworks. However, I will only mention the purpose. So while the prudential framework look for ensuring the safety and subnet of banks with the objective of protecting depositors and maintaining financial stability, the AML framework is most focused on verifying that the obliged entities, which goes beyond banks and financial institutions, have in place proper procedures and safeguards to avoid money laundering, as well as to collect and analyze suspicion transactions. Please, next, next slide. Next slide, please. Against this background, it is uh, convenient to draw a line and delineate the competence of AML and prudential supervisors, including the ECB. In other words, an answer to the following questions is, uh, is essential. Where do the competence of prudential supervisors end and those of AML authorities begin? And how should each authority rely on the facts shared by the other in order to exercise their own competences? These challenges are even more relevant in jurisdictions where the AMLA and prudential authority do not rest within the same institution. Well, the good news is that the General Court in the Verso Bank and Anglo-Austrian Bank cases have brought some light on these questions. Uh, Odront and Georgia has, uh, has went into the, into the content of these uh, pieces of legislation, but I would like also to stress what for my, the purpose of my presentation is the main takeaway. That is, that while setting the facts, establishing breaches of the MLA legislation falls within the competence of the MLA supervisor, the legal assessment and the proportionality of the prudential measures to tackle those breaches from a prudential perspective lies on the prudential supervisor. Next slide, please. Well, in these uh, three slides, I will introduce the Spanish AML institutional setting. Let me anticipate you that it is quite complex, so I try to simplify it. So basically, we have centralized on one authority, the AML task. This is the Commission for the Prevention of Money Laundering and Monetary Infringements, the so-called COPLAG. COPLAG is a collegiate body under the umbrella of the Ministry of Economic Affairs and is composed by representatives from a wide variety of AML agencies, policy makers, the Ministry of Economic Affairs, the public prosecution, police, and also financial entities, prudential supervisors. Two bodies support the COPLAGS in the performance of its mandate, the Secretariat and the Executive Service for the Prevention of Money Laundering and Monetary Infringements, the so-called CEPLAC. Focusing on the CEPLAC, this is the Financial Intelligence Unit at hand and also has been entrusted with the supervision of AML obligations, but 
and this is uh, relevant here, the supervision would be done in cooperation with prudential supervisors, provided that there are in place a memorandum of understanding with that authority. Next slide, please. Let me now elaborate a bit more on, on this memorandum of understanding between the COPLAG and Banco de España. Why am MOU? It is because the Spanish law on MLA provides that the prudential supervisor can only carry out the supervision of certain AML obligations of entities under their prudential supervision scope, provided that an MOU with COPLAG, with COPLAG is in place. So the MOU is the instrument that gives Banco de España AML supervisory task. In, the, in 2021, a new mode was negotiated. This MOU develops the cooperation and information exchange between CEPLAC and Banco de España and also reflects the SSM and the need to come on, on the ECB as a new player. It is the fourth agreement in place since 2005. Due to time constraints, I will only highlight a few points on the, on the MOU. Please, net, uh, next slide. So the MOU allow Banco de España to carry out material inspections of several AML obligations of banks, but in cooperation with, uh, with CEPLAC. The MLA obligations that are assessed by Banco de España are those procedures and arrangements of banks related to due diligence, reporting obligations, and internal control. However, please be, uh, keep in mind that COPLAGs retain the authority to issue binding requirements or impose sanctions. So then, how does this uh, framework work in practice? In practice, so basically, when Banco de España carries out AML inspections, it can directly issue recommendations to bank to overcome the AML deficits. This is done on the inspections report. However, if Banco de España considers that the deficiencies imply breaches of AML regulation, it should draft a report to COPLAG proposing to either issue a binding request and or to open sanctioning procedures. In any event, COPLAG, and based on the findings detected, can take on its own initiative any measures without a, a proposal from Banco de España. It is uh, worth saying that if Banco de España considers that those breaches of AML obligations have a prudential impact on the banks, it will be for Banco de España or the ECB in their capacity of prudential supervisors to take the appropriate prudential measures over the credit institutions. Finally, in my opinion, this uh, uh, Spanish framework is compatible with the VersoBank judgment. Uh, let's move into the next slide, please. In this slide, you can see the difference of scope of MLA supervisory tax between CEPLAC and Banco de España. While CEPLAC is in charge of the supervision of the whole catalog of obliged entities, Banco de España's tasks are limited to the financial entities subject to the prudential supervision. The main reason for centralizing at national level the supervision of all AML of light entities is to reach a consistent domestic supervision in the field of AML. Next slide, please. Now let me go uh, on to the main legal challenges that Banco de España faces uh, from a legal point of view in its capacity as prudential supervisor. The first one that I would like to talk concerns the allocation of competence to withdraw the banking license due to breaches of AML. In the Spanish legal framework, the withdrawal of license due to serious breaches of AML is only provided as a sanction in the law transposing the AMLA directive, but is not provided as a ground for withdrawal in the transposition of CRD. Moreover, the competence to impose such sanction is for the Council of Ministers at the proposal of Ministers of Economic Affairs and with a report from the Supervisory Authority. Let me stress that this distribution of powers under the Spanish framework fits in the MLA directive. In particular, the second paragraph of Article 58 of the directive allows member states to decide which national authority will be the competent authority for AML task including for the imposition of the sanctions, such as the withdrawal of the authorizations. Moreover, please note that the paragraph 5 of the mentioned Article 58 
the AMLA authorities may exercise their powers to impose sanctions directly, but also in collaboration with other authorities. Therefore, the allocation of the competence to the Council of Ministers for the imposition of such sanction would be the option chosen by the Spanish legislator within the margin of discretion provided by the AMLA directive. However, it is worth saying and recognize that this national regime seems not to be aligned with the distribution of competence established in the CSN regulation. Indeed, according to the CSN regulation, it will be for the ECB the exclusive competence to authorize and withdraw the banking license of both significant and less significant institutions, and also in cases of withdrawal due to AML serious breaches. This exclusive competence of the ECB has been endorsed by the General Court in the Verso Bank and also in the anglo austrian Bank cases. So what should we do in this context? Although in our jurisdiction we have not faced yet any withdrawal due, uh, withdrawal license due to a, a breaches of MLA rules, the legal conflict could be overcome by invoking the primacy of EU law and the direct effect of EU regulations. However, and among us, I would rather prefer an amendment to, the, to our national legislation in order to solve this misalignment. Please, next slide. The next challenge that I would like to talk about is regarding the way risks related to MLA are considered in different prudential supervisory procedures, in particular, qualifying holding and licensing. In both procedures, the Spanish framework required a report from the AML authority assessing the MLA risk of the transactions or the way and the procedures and mechanism for dealing with money laundering risk in case of authorization procedures. As in the Spanish framework, the MLA and Prudential Authority differs, the approach followed so far by Banco de España's Prudential Supervisor is to rely on the judgment of the MLA authority when assessing the AML risk in those supervisory procedures. The open question that arises here is whether the recent Versobank ruling would affect the practice followed so far. In my personal opinion, the reflections made by Georgia regarding the duty of diligence are also ap uh, applicable to the ECB, would also be useful for Banco de España in its capacity of prudential supervisor. However, as she mentioned, there are still open questions on how should the duty of diligence apply when assessing the risk of money laundering in a qualifying holding. Next slide, please. Well, if science, if time constraints allow me, I would like to finish my presentation with a short recap. The first one concerns the national regime of the allocation of MLA task. As I mentioned, even if a centralized supervision of MLA obliged entities could have a few advantages, like domestic consistency, we have seen that it has also some challenges. It is more complex and hinder coordinations between relevant authorities. There is a clear link between AML and prudential risk. This framework is not aligned with the predominant uh, institutional setup in place in, in nearly all European countries. Therefore, in my opinion, an allocation of the supervision of MLA obligations related, for example, to internal controls and governance arrangement with decision powers to Banco de España could benefit from the synergies coming from the prudential supervision and would also contribute to institutional efficiency. The second takeaway is that the recent court cases, Verso Bank and AAB Bank cases, give us some food for thought on the way prudential supervisory, prudential authorities should use, should use relevant AML facts. The last reflection that I would like to make is a look into the near future. As you all know, the EU approach in the AML field was basically based on a minimum harmonization directive with a strong focus on national law. However, money laundry cannot be fought in isolation. Complementing the developments explained by Odron in her presentation, the European legislator is taking steps towards harmonizations on the approach to tackle a AML issues. In particular, I would like to mention three instruments of the new proposal of the AML legislative package. The first one if, is the draft regulation establishing a new European authority with supervisory competence on AML. It will be a central authority that will coordinate national authorities to ensure that private sectors consistently apply the EU rules. 
it will also exercise direct supervisions over third-time financial institution. There will be also a new AML regulation with direct applicable rules that will go deep on the harmonization at European level of third-time AML obligations like due diligence. And finally, the legislators are also working on, up, on an update to the directive on AMLA that will be the sixth, with intents to reinforce the powers of national supervisions and financial intelligence unions, and will also increase harmonization. That will be all from my side. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much to you, Rafa, for adding this interesting perspective of, of, of an NCA also for sharing with us very relevant reflection. A very special thank you for the three panelists for being so mindful of the time and so efficient in their presentation, which allow us now to have a rich discussion. Let me remind you about the rules to ask questions. I said at the beginning, yes, use the hand button in your WebEx and at that point you will be invited to ask the question in that moment is when you have to unmute yourself and switch on your camera so we can all listen to your questions so while we wait uh to the audience uh, from questions from the audience i may start with one myself that I can share with, with the panelists. I invited any of them who would like to, to reflect. And it's related to the, to the notion of breach of AML and CFT requirements. And the joint report of the European Supervisory Authorities on the withdrawal of authorization for serious breaches of AML CFT rules published recently in May of this year says that a breach should be understood as any violation of AML CFT rule committed by an obliged entity which has been identified by the competent authority, so the AML CFT supervisor. I personally find this definition very sensible and in my opinion it's fully in line with the way the ACP has applied this, the notion of breach in practice. But I will be particularly interested in the views of the panelists about the way the the AML CFT competent authority should identify this breach. I, I personally will say that the legal provisions and also the recent cases to which you have referred during today's panel do not impose any limitations or formalities on how this determination or identification of the breaches is done by the competent authorities. But I will be very much interested in listening to the views of our panelists today also on this on this question and i don't know if maybe otrone or georgia would like to start i can start maybe yeah yeah indeed carmen i i fully agree with you i think that the legal framework when it refers to these institutions being found liable of serious aml cft breaches provided of course <clears throat> a very um, important indication which competent authorities uh, exercising the power to withdraw the license should follow but um, it is not in my view a, a very narrow uh, field so in the sense that in compliance with the, the scope of the ECB's duty of care I believe that on a case-by-case -case basis it should be assessed whether the source where the information where the evidence provided by the YML, the YML authority in which the breach is established should be assessed by the ECB in order to consider, for example, whether this is, I don't know, a preliminary report or rather a final satisfaction report. This was the cases, for example, of Versobank. This is in the factual background of the Versobank judgment or an administrative decision or a ruling of a national court, which is uh, in the factual background of the AAB bank case. So I don't think there is a close list of um, documents which could or should provide evidence of this breach. What is important in my view is that the ECB, when assessing these documents provided by the EML authority, does it with a view of ensuring that it carries out a complete um, examination of all the information and that this information 
appears to be reliable in light with the indication provided by the case law on the digital care. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, uh, on, Carmen, if I compliment, please, please. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, um, thank you, Carmen. I share George's view that uh, we should not see um, the list, list being documents that uh, set out uh, evidence and facts. Uh, that is uh, fully within the remit of uh, national authorities uh, that uh, um, implement acts uh, transposing AML directive. And um, indeed, the variety of situations uh, would not uh, necessarily speak for such a narrow list uh, being established. Uh, we've already discussed in this panel that um, the evidence and facts uh, fall within the competence or establishment of uh, facts and evidence falls in the competence of the national authorities uh, that follow their relevant national procedures for that purpose and uh, the ecb uh, nevertheless uh, even if uh, it has to rely uh, on the facts and evidence uh, obtained um, from the national authorities, it carries out its own uh, assessment uh, and legal appreciation because at the end, uh, uh, for instance, more specifically, the withdrawal of banking authorization, it is uh, the ECB uh, that has to defend its decision um, in court. And that's why this assessment that the ECB can is of uh, uh, ultimate importance in order to ensure the of uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we are facing so many technical issues, Sobrone. We cannot hear you. Sorry, you. We cannot hear you very well. The connection got interrupted, but but at least myself, I could get that you were following a bit the same line as George. It was a bit unfortunate that with the connection, we, we didn't, we could not hear absolutely everything you said. But I think I am, I can say I understood that you are very much in the same line as Georgia, right? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Odrone. I hope we can. Thank you. I hope we can reconnect soon fully with you. In the meantime, I see we have uh, questions from from the audience. First one is coming from Giovanni Bassani. Um, Giovanni, I think you will be invited now to ask your question. Please do not forget to unmute yourself and switch on your camera. And the floor is yours. We can hear you a bit, bit far away, Giovanni. Uh, sorry, I, I tried. I tried to speak. I, um, I think you have to try to speak loud. Okay, I, I will try to speak loud. So Better thank you now. for the presentation. I think it was very clear, and also this uh, general distinction in the in the framework between uh, assessment. I mean, verification of the facts and assessment of the facts. Uh, whether they amount to, to a justifiable grounds uh, for withdrawal, or I would say in the case of a qualifying only for objection. My question is more related to, to, to the future because um, I, I discovered recently that actually in the um, CRD6 proposal from the, from the Commission, uh, this uh, sort of neat uh, separation and distinction would be actually, at least for, for qualifying only, would be. Um, obliterated because my understanding is that the, the, the proposal from the commission would actually give a sort of uh, uh, power for the national um, anti-money laundering authorities to object to a transaction uh, at least as far as i understand only for qualifying all the not for withdrawal so this distinction would, would be maintained for the for the, for the withdrawal uh, of a license but to object uh, to a, 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 an acquisition of a qualifying holding. And if this acquisition is in writing, the ECB or potentially in other member states, other um, supervisory authorities could only take note uh, of this objection and oppose uh, the acquisition. 
And this seems to be really a very significant change in this neat distinction and separation of, of, of competencies, where actually the National anti money Laundering Authority would have a sort of uh, veto powers uh, on what uh, the, 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 the Prudential Supervisory Authority is actually going to do. I was wondering how much this uh, significant change has been thought through and also for instances for aspects are related in, in, in the case of the ECB or changes also in the jurisdictional competence or challenging, challenging this, this, this uh, supervisory decision because it will probably go back to the national courts. So it seems to be a, a very significant change. I'm not sure uh, how much uh, this, this, this change of, of, of the general framework has been actually um, thought through. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Giovanni. I'm thinking as, as the question concerns the, the Commission pro CRD proposal, Odrona, you, you may want to start sharing something. All right, do you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, so indeed, uh, the provision uh, on qualifying uh, holdings um, is one of those that uh, is subject to the CRD law. Yes, we hear you, Odrone. Uh, Maybe if you okay, try to because... switch off the video, it's a bit better. I you want to try? I'm mm, No. Okay. Um, yeah, I think so. Maybe the technical service could call on my Jason. I, unfortunately, I think we have some difficulties to follow, uh, Odrone. Do, do you hear me? Now, yes, Let, let's give another try. All right. So, um, we are, of course, um, speaking about the Commission's proposal, which is uh, in uh, negotiations with uh, co legislators, and we don't know how will the provision in question uh, will look like once adopted. Now, the objective behind that provision indeed was to give a more, a more prominent role to the AML authorities. Uh, and that is, uh, at least how I see it, very much in line with the general policy objectives of the Union, as well as uh, what we see in the case law that has been discussed. Uh, in the panel. So essentially, uh, would that in case of qualifying holdings, uh, the AML authorities would still be the ones uh, that could uh, establish the relevant facts and gather evidence uh, and provide, of course, its assessment uh, to the banking supervisor. Uh, I would not uh, myself uh, read uh, the provision in question as establishing um, a veto power, as a colleague has uh, referred to, because uh, that, in my uh, view, would somewhat tend to upset uh, the competences attributed to the banking supervisors and would upset uh, would upset the balance. Uh, um, of course, uh, if the provision is adopted as it is, it would require uh, an interpretation, uh, not only probably at the level of institution, but eventually uh, would uh, require an interpretation from uh, the court. Uh, and uh, if we speak about uh, here a composite uh, procedure where uh, there is a decision uh, of the AML authority and then uh, the banking supervisor has to take a decision as well, the question naturally arises who bears the responsibility for such a decision and uh, hence who is the proper defendant. So I think um, uh, this is a very pertinent. Uh, this is a very pertinent question, and um, well, to be seen how the provision looks once adopted. But the intention 
uh, in my view of the Commission, uh, when uh, adopting the proposal, uh, in particular for or with regard to this uh, provision, was to strengthen the role of uh, the AML uh, national authority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Odrone. Indeed, an in interesting question. And yeah, let, let's let's see how how finally this proposal is adopted, and let's hope that yes, the, the the commission, the legislator, provide all necessary clarifications for the ECV for the prudential supervisors to apply it in the most effective manner. Thank you. I think we still have time for another question. I think it, we can give the floor to Jakob Cherovsek. Uh, Jakob, please remember to unmute your micro, switch on the camera. Don't get worried if it takes a few seconds to WebEx, and then we will be able all to see you and listen to your question. Thank you. I believe that you must see me by now. Is that the yes, case? Yes, we do. Thank you, Carmen. Um, I was wondering, in light of the uh, uh, intricate relationship between the NCS and the ECB, which I understand has been clarified to a certain extent when it comes to AML supervision in recent judgments, um, all these judgments concerned to withdrawal decisions. I was wondering whether the panelists believe that they already provide enough clarity also for um, other areas where AML is prominent, such as qualifying holdings and fit and proper supervision, or whether they would welcome some more clarity from the court, also perhaps in challenges to, say, qualifying holding decisions, or how do they view uh, the court findings provided so far? Thanks a lot, Jacob, for the question. Georgia, would you like to give uh, yes, your first views? Yeah, Thank you. Of course. So indeed, Jacob, <clears throat> Uh, I fully agree. I mean, we have seen, uh, thanks to Odron and, and Rafa's presentation, that the union legal framework requires the ECB to take into account the AML, CFD aspects when performing uh, its uh, supervisory tasks. We have also seen that the judgments in Verso Bank and the AEB Bank, um, in these judgments, the General Court consider that indeed, while the competence to uh, supervised compliance with AML provision is a competence which remains with national AML authorities, the ECB still has a duty to perform a diligent examination of the findings of such authorities to the extent these findings are relevant to substantiate the ECB's own decision. So I believe that this conclusion is applicable to all uh, the um, other supervisory tasks uh, to the extent in which the ECB in the exercise of them uh, takes into account or factors in AML CFD considerations. So I'm thinking, of course, about other qualifying holding procedures, so license, uh, granting of a license, um, qualifying all this, but also, as you correctly mentioned, uh, fit and proper assessment, but also ongoing supervision itself. So all these cases in which, for example, AML deficiencies could be a symptom of unsound governance or deficiencies in the internal control mechanism. Um, so I think we have uh, this important indication from the court. I also believe at the same time that for specific supervisory tasks, uh, um, additional clarifications from the court concerning um, a more precise delineation of the scope of the ECB's uh, duty of care would be welcome. Um, I have in mind again the topic of the qualifying all the procedure because this is a very different <laughs> procedure from the withdrawals. So, for example, the type of evidence which usually substantiates a potential negative qualifying all so the opposition to the acquisition of a qualifying all is evidence which does not relate uh, or does not only relate to past facts, uh, such as in withdrawal cases or so these breaches of AML provisions. It's also or mainly a forward looking assessment. So this is a different type of evidence. It would be interesting to know how the court considers that the ECB should assess this evidence, which is more an assessment as this component of an assessment of a forward looking assessment. 
And in addition, the, the very same provision under Article 23, paragraph 2, uh, um, stipulates that the ECB may oppose the acquisition of a qualifying holding when there are reasonable grounds to consider that relevant criteria are met. And this is also an interesting point. So when is this forward-looking evidence conclusive to uh, achieve uh, the determination that the, the criterion is met? Because this reasonable ground seems to point to a different um, standard compared to the standard of conclusive evidence which is required for withdrawal decisions. So these are all points which differentiates a bit the type of assessment um, of a qualifying holding acquisition and of a withdrawal decision on which I, I believe, I personally believe that um, further clarifications from the general court, from union courts would be, would be welcome. Thanks a lot, Georgia. I don't know if Odrone or Rafa would like to share something on this also. Uh, very briefly, I would like to mention uh, the judgment of uh, 2018 in the Berlusconi case, where um, uh, the court examined uh, the ECB decision opposing um, an acquisition of a qualifying holding um, by uh, a company owned um, by Mr. Berlusconi, who was convinced, uh, convicted uh, of a tax fraud. Of course, we are not speaking about the AML CFT breaches, but we do have this very prominent judgment of 2018 uh, uh, regarding qualifying uh, holdings uh, procedure that was applicable at the time. And I would uh, suggest uh, also not to forget this judgment that could be reread looking for some interesting insights. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Odrone. And, and thanks for, for spotting this, which is fully true. And we have this very important case concerning the allocation of competences in the field of qualifying holdings indeed. From what I can see, I think we do not have other questions from the audience. And therefore, this I think with this, we are bringing to an end our discussion today. I would like to thank again the panelists for the interesting presentations and for being here, and also all the audience for listening to us. I saw that we have had 102 participants, and also we had very stimulating questions. I thank you all also for this. I would like to remind you that we will resume at quarter past four with Chiara's concluding remark and to close the conference. So I think we have now time for a little break and I'm looking forward to see all of you again or to, to welcome you again for the conclusion of the conference in 15 minutes. Thank you very much again for your participation.